the house that Ruth built, the eighth wonder of the world, baseball stadiums, American icons, sandlots, wooden ballparks, multi-purpose stadiums, concrete, steel, now baseball parks on modern marbles. Baseball, the national pastime, making the good times memorable and the bad times bearable. The childhood heroes, the smell of the grass, the crack of the bat, and the memories of warm summer days spent at the ballpark. It really is something that just overwhelms you and fills you with some sort of uh, emotion when you step uh, out from underneath the stands and, and that field is before you. And certainly the imagery that, that the ballpark embeds on you, in your mind's eye, stays with you forever. The parks are part of the enduring legacy of baseball, each adding its own imprint to our memories. These ballparks, they're almost monuments to the game, even though they're living things. They were truly monuments to the glory of America's national pastime. Today's games are held in technological wonders. The fans experiencing the game firsthand will be subjected to blinding lights ear-splitting noises and fiery explosions, all of which heighten the baseball experience. But what goes on behind the scenes is just as impressive. The average baseball park is a city unto itself, able to provide food, shelter, medicine, sanitation, and all other necessary amenities on a massive scale. At a typical game, the fans will consume 26,000 hot dogs and sausages, 37,000 cups of soda and beer, tons of popcorn, peanuts and pretzels. They will utilize souvenir shops, people movers, 50 plus bathrooms, where 40,000 gallons of water will flow. All services provided with assembly line efficiency, without the fans giving it a second thought. But unlike the city, the average park is a single structure. It has more than 10,000 feet of plumbing and enough railing to stretch five miles. Over 2,000 60-foot pilings anchor enough steel and concrete to build a 50-story building. Welcome to Camden Yards in Baltimore. Nestled between the Baltimore docks and the historic Camden Railroad Station, the park opened in 1992 Camden is a thoroughly modern facility with the ability to seat 48,000. Camden Yards is a beautiful facility. Even without a baseball game going on, you know this is a baseball park. This place has been built for baseball, and it is unlikely that anything other than baseball will take place in this facility. The secret to Camden Yards' revolutionary design was hindsight. Parks of the past were smaller than today's stadiums, allowing a more intimate setting. Games were experienced, not just watched. By looking to great ballparks of the past, designers found the key to Camden Yards' success. The Camden Yards really, really signaled the, the dawn of a new era in ballpark design and, and bringing back the, the unique uh, baseball park experience. I think it's been a wonderful element added to the game and I think when my successes 50 to 75 years from now look back on the period they will look back on this on this era the same way we look back at the you know the period 1909 to 1914. It's been a time that's very special. Baseball's story begins in the early 1800s teams representing small towns would challenge neighboring communities in competitions 
only slightly more organized than modern schoolyard games. But it was not until the 1850s that insightful businessmen recognized the financial potential and created professional teams and the novel concept of a ballpark where the fans would pay to see a game. Baseball ballparks started about the 1850s. It was a brand new game in the middle of the 1800s, and soon it became a professional game in the 1860s. They started building places to keep people out who didn't pay a little bit of money. That very act of enclosing the park is really the beginning of professional sports in America. The first enclosed ballpark was Union Grounds in Brooklyn, opened in 1862. It had been a uh, an ice skating rink for a couple of years and had bombed. Union grounds would come to typify many of the early parks. It was small, wooden, and horseshoe shaped. Seating only 1,500 people, it was considered large for the time. As the game's popularity grew, similar parks began to spring up around the eastern seaboard. So there was the National Association, then the National League, then the American Association, then the Union Association. So every time you have a new uh, league, you have, depending on how many teams, six to ten new parks. A baseball park building boom was on, but the new ballparks faced a problem that would continue to plague baseball into the modern era, real estate. The parks had to be close enough to the cities to attract spectators. Even the most ardent fan would not travel long distances via horse and buggy to watch a game. But finding a cheap piece of land close to the city, large enough to hold a ballpark, was difficult. Baseball learned to compromise. Ballparks such as National League Park in Philadelphia, later renamed the Baker Bowl, were shoehorned into already crowded downtown areas, giving each park its own distinctive shape and character. Baker Bowl started in the 1890s. It was a ballpark where the surrounding streets determined the size of the ballpark and determined the shape of the ballpark. The distance from home plate to the right field fence was very short, less than 300 feet. The distance was so short that a 40-foot high right field fence had to be constructed to limit the number of home runs. It might be exaggerating to say the outfield wall cast a shadow across the infield, but if the right fielder had eaten onions at lunch, the second baseman knew it. Red Smith, sports writer. Initially, the ballparks were utilitarian, simple structures made of wood to seat the fans. But that would change with Boston South End grounds. The first real breakthrough in ballpark constructions, when ballparks became an art, was South End grounds in Boston. That was a beautiful ballpark. It had these witches' peaks. They're just for decoration. And that's the first time that owners really spent on decorating their parks. Like a scene from Camelot, the South End grounds look more like a place where armored knights rather than baseball players would do battle. Initially built in 1871, by 1877, after continual renovation, the two-tiered grandstands and adjoining bleachers had a seating capacity of 5,000. When you see that park with those witches' peaks, those conical uh, tops on it, you know that this is not just another wooden slap it up in a couple of weeks kind of a job. Uh, this was clearly meant to present the ballpark as an entertainment palace. As the crowds continued to grow and the parks were regularly altered to seat more fans, some of the remedies to overcrowding would be unheard of today. In those early days, the crowd was allowed in the field. There was not that much attention to pay to the home runs, so people were allowed to stand at the back of the park against the, uh, against the outfield wall, maybe, maybe uh, restrained by a rope, but uh, pretty much they had, uh, they pretty much had free reign on games that were popular and sold out. The standing room was actually on the field itself. The polo grounds at Coogan's Bluff, just across the Harlem River from Manhattan, was constructed in 1891 originally seating 5,000 fans through many incarnations, the park was eventually able to seat 16,000 fans by the end of the 19th century. Growing popularity and larger, more opulent facilities were a boon to baseball, but these outward successes masked a menacing, sometimes deadly threat, fire. Obviously, the earliest ballparks were made of wood. 
um, and because of that they didn't last too long. Virtually every early park uh, lasted maybe eight to ten years before a fire took them down. Most of the fires were started accidentally by the fans, with carelessly discarded cigars or smoldering matches. The 1890s saw at least 21 ballparks burst into flames. During one particularly bad season, 20 people lost their lives. If baseball were to continue to grow, the parks would need to be both larger and safer. It would take a leap forward in construction technology to propel baseball into its golden age. By the turn of the century, baseball was well established. Thousands flocked to parks up and down the eastern seaboard. The simple wooden structures couldn't contain the game's growing popularity. Fire was not the only hazard. In August of 1903, the stands in Philadelphia's Baker Bowl collapsed, killing 12 and injuring 100. That's one of the dark sides of ballparks in general, is fans who uh, are either seriously injured or die falling out of stands or having stands collapse. So it got to be a serious, serious endeavor then. Uh, anything that's concerned with human life and money is generally serious. Baseball had outgrown its quaint old wooden ballparks. The next generation of parks would follow the lead of other industries and take advantage of relatively new construction materials. Pennsylvania, home to America's booming steel industry, would be at the forefront. Games would now be played in stadiums, built from steel and reinforced concrete. The thing about steel and concrete was that you could take this and round it behind home plate uh, gradually to get all kinds of wonderful seats behind home plate and with Concrete and steel, of course, came the possibility of double-decking the park. And, of course, you could extend the wings up the left and right field lines. And that was the real genius of it. It is also no, no coincidence at all that the, the first two steel and concrete parks built from scratch were also built in Pennsylvania. Philadelphia's Shy Park named after team owner Ben Scheib, became the first steel and concrete stadium. Capable of seating 30,000 fans, this park retained its intimate surroundings, but also boasted such improvements as ramps, rooms for umpires and visiting teams, and a copula, the precursor to the modern skybox. Constructed in the French Renaissance style, the park featured decorative concrete trim over every archway and window. It didn't look like just an ordinary place where baseball games were played. It looked like places where were for almost for a religious ceremony. That's because around 1910, baseball was peaking in terms of its popularity. Its popularity began really uh, accelerating around 1908 till 1910. 19-teens, where baseball was the national game without question. Scheib Park reflected this. It was a temple to this new sport that had taken over the country. Scheib's original right field fence stood 12 feet tall, allowing enterprising residents who lived on the adjoining street to watch home games from the comfort of their own roofs. Some even built bleachers, which began to cut into ballpark revenue. The solution came in 1935 in the form of a 22-foot vertical extension to the existing wall, a wall locals continued to refer to as the spike fence. Carl Scheib and his partner Connie Mack put together the first original steel and concrete park which opened in 1909. And that is really the, uh, the first, quote, modern ballpark, unquote. I should also add that it came after 1908, the year that Take Me Out to the Ball Game was written, also the year that the first real wonderful baseball cards were printed by American Tobacco. So that was a big year. And with baseball on the front page in eight cities, you can, you can see that everybody and his brother was saying, oh boy, oh boy, now we're going to build a big ballpark. And that really is the story from 1909 to 1915. The next five years were a golden age for ballpark construction. 
no fewer than 11 parks with legendary names such as Wrigley, Ebbets, and Fenway would rise as shrines to America's love for the game. When you talk about the, the urban ballparks like Ebbets Field, Forbes Field, Fenway Park, you're talking about ballparks that were right in a neighborhood. And so it would stand to reason that there would be more of a community feeling. The most unique thing about all those parks to me is the fact that they were fit on an urban parcel, which made for some unique angles. And, and the fact that they tended to go straight up on the sides so that instead of going back and pushing the upper deck farther away from the playing field, you had an upper deck in addition to a lower deck that was very close to the field and ultimately a more intimate experience. But more than just the architecture was changing the ballpark experience. One man's vision would forever alter the way fans enjoy the game. The ballpark also had its own ambience uh, by the turn of the century, and a lot of that was the, was the result of the work of one man, Harry M. Stevens. He was an uh, immigrant, came to the uh, United States in the, in the 1870s. Stevens was a lay minister, making a meager salary selling books in Columbus, Ohio. Seeing how well he sold books, a couple of businessmen approached him about selling their scorecards at a local baseball game. Stevens jumped at the chance. Shortly thereafter, he negotiated with the team owner the rights to sell and publish scorecards at the game. That became so lucrative, Harry uh, moved to New York and started doing it with the major ballparks. Uh, by the end of the century, he was also selling ice cream. By that time, he was also known as the scorecard man, Harry Stevens, the scorecard man. But he started selling food, basically ice cream, and on one particular day, it was particularly cold, so he sent one of his employees around the corner to a, to a, a market to, to buy some, what they called at that time, um, dash on the dachshund sausages and Vienna rolls. And they cooked them up and he sent his people up into the stands yelling, get your red hots, get your red hots. So that's how the, the hot dog became a part of the American uh, baseball scene. Stephen's menus expanded and his food service became big business that continues to this day. But he wasn't alone in transforming a modest idea into part of baseball lore. The stadiums that would become American icons and would eventually embody the spirit of baseball were first and foremost business ventures with surprisingly humble beginnings. 1913, Charles Abbott's built Abbott's Field in Brooklyn. And it was in a section of Brooklyn called Pig Town. It was an open garbage pit. Well, what was so great about an open garbage pit? Low real estate prices. Other landmark ballparks owe their existence to more than just baseball. Fenway Park, if you know what a fen is, it's a bog. And it was owned by the family that owned the Boston Globe. And it was a real estate scam, in essence. They couldn't move this land, so Junior Taylor decided to buy the Red Sox, build them a ballpark, sell it at a profit and get out, which is exactly what happened. Though less than ideally located, the parks utilized state-of-the-art construction techniques. Structural steel and reinforced concrete allowed the parks to be stronger and to the owner's delight, larger. They were more easily erected, durable, and had the added bonus of being fireproof qualities necessary for the next step in ballpark evolution, the Super Stadium. With baseball's growing popularity, even larger stadiums were needed. Existing parks were regularly altered to increase their seating capacity. But building additional seats into the already shoehorned parks made for some interesting configurations. A number of the traditional of the older ballparks had some idiosyncrasies. The polo grounds, the, the clubhouse was in center field, so after the game, the, the players from both teams had to run out and scoot across the field, up the stairs uh, behind the, the center fields and the grandstand. The Fenway Park uh, left field had a hill. Um, also, I believe Crosley Field did it as well. Uh, the same thing, they had a, a berm that actually ran, uh, ran up to the, to the outfield fence. Park owners had to be careful. 
the idiosyncrasies which gave the parks their unique feel were a windfall to crafty fans. A lot of people watched the ball games for free at the polo grounds from Coogan's Bluff, which was a high rise of a hill that went well above the top of the stadium so that you were behind home plate and if you look down you see the roof of the ballpark. The revamping of old parks could only go so far. New construction technology allowed the first of a number of super stadiums to be built. Constructed in 1915, Braves Field in Boston was the world's largest ballpark to date, costing over one million dollars and equal in size to an 18-hole golf course, the stadium sat 42,000. The brainchild of Braves owner James Gaffney, the park was designed to create his favorite type of plays, inside the park home runs. With a distance of 402 feet down each foul line and an immense 550 feet to center field, not one home run cleared the fences in Braves Field during its first 10 years in use. That was before the home run became very popular, and baseball at that time was a baseball of one-run games, guys getting on first, trying to steal second, hit and run, trying to get one run at a time, and Braves Field was built on the basis that this is the way you played baseball. You didn't try to hit home runs. You tried to get doubles and triples and steal bases and so on. Then when you tried to steal second and the ball went past the second baseman into the outfield, you might get all the way home before the outfielder could get to it. In contrast, an even larger stadium was being constructed that would become famous for the number of home runs hit as well as the men who hit them. A new era began in 1922 when the Yankees made their move from the 30,000-seat polo grounds, which they shared with the New York Giants, to the 75,000-seat Yankee Stadium. What would seem to be a natural move for the Yankees was more an exercise in survival. In 1921, a jealous John McGraw, owner of the polo grounds and rival New York Giants, evicted the Yankees from their uptown Manhattan location. McGraw was unable to contend with the Yankees' growing gate receipts and popularity of their star slugger, George Herman Ruth. McGraw's plan for the Yankees was simple. If we kick them out, they won't be able to find another location on Manhattan Island. They'll have to move to the Bronx or Long Island. The fans will forget all about them and they'll be through. The Yankees fought back by constructing the greatest baseball stadium ever seen. The location chosen just across the Harlem River within eyesight of the polo grounds. Yankee Stadium was a pinnacle and maybe the pinnacle for ballpark construction. It was the first triple-decker stadium. It was the first huge stadium, 65,000 and change, 70,000, 78,000 for some games, even though the fire marshals were petrified and it was all made possible by Babe Ruth. So, let's call the house that Ruth built. Ah, Homer, the first in Yankee Stadium, the first of many for Babe Ruth. 1923 is a great year for Ruth. He sets his all-time batting mark, and the Yanks win their first World Series. Though credited to the Sultan of Swat, the true builders of the stadium were the team of New York-based White Construction Company and Cleveland's Osborne Engineering. Osborne's prior baseball park experience had made it the logical choice for the job. Osborne Engineering Company, uh, uh, from the turn of the century, uh, starting with the polo grounds in New York, uh, designed the Ford Field, Ebbets Field, Fenway Park, Yankee Stadium. We did over 100 stadiums over the years. Osborne did the plans, White Construction did the construction, promised to have it done in a year, did it in 11 months, under budget, just about the smoothest job going. And the numbers are staggering, the amount of wood, the amount of concrete, the amount of steel. 2,200 tons of structural steel and 28,000 cubic yards of reinforced concrete were needed 
to construct the stadium which occupied 10 acres of land. An additional 950,000 board feet of lumber were used to construct the bleachers. The $2 million facility was the first venue to be called a stadium, where fans watched men with names like DiMaggio, Gary, and Ruth become baseball legends. In baseball, the only thing bigger than Yankee Stadium were the men who played there. Yankee Stadium is significant in history because Babe Ruth played in Yankee Stadium. And Babe Ruth was the greatest baseball player by far that has ever lived. After that, Joe DiMaggio took over in the outfield. And after that, Mickey Mantle. So greatness is on the turf at Yankee Stadium. That's why it's so famous. The stadiums and super stadiums constructed in the first quarter of the century would serve baseball for decades. From 1923 to 1952, only one baseball stadium was built, Cleveland's Municipal Stadium. But baseball itself did not stagnate. In 1935, one technical achievement would forever change the way we watch the game, lights. The first night game was played at Crossley Field in Cincinnati, May 24, 1935, and President Roosevelt through the switch in the White House, activating the lights. Obviously, there was tremendous value to having people come to the ballpark at the end of the workday. And it wasn't fr friendly for kids, but it was great for adults, working people. With the light came larger crowds, and the old stadiums needed to make way for the new. An era ended in 1960 with the raising of Ebbets Field in Brooklyn. And now it's play ball again, but not the sort Dodger fans cheer. This time, Ebbets Field itself is struck out. As the venues aged, the cost of operations and upkeep increased. Due to economic difficulties by the 1960s, Team owners and city officials thought it best to create one home for all professional sporting activities, thus spreading the financial burden. By the 1960s, parks built in the first quarter of the century were deteriorating. The stadiums were becoming more and more expensive to maintain. Always on the lookout for a way to save money, team owners joined local politicians and decided the new stadiums needed to be multi-purpose facilities. You have uh, ball clubs that are saying, now, now we're in ballparks that are, are pushing 60 years old. They're starting to show their age. Uh, our people want a nicer ambiance to go to the, the ballpark. To combat ever-rising real estate prices for the first time, owners looked outside of city limits for places to build their new modern stadiums. The stadiums that were built, that started to be built in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, uh, tended to be located uh, outside of cities on large uh, uh, plots of land that uh, planners call super blocks, uh, which meant that the stadium was not constrained by anything. You had the stadium located on the super blocks surrounded by parking. And typically sites were chosen for their proximity to freeways. The new parks sacrifice the ambiance and intimacy of the older parks. There is a space age quality to them, you know, spaceship looking kind of places, lots of concrete, lots of plastic in the seating bowl. A real departure from the, the older ballparks. And so they're reflective, I think, of the time period that they were built and for a certain time period served a very definite purpose. One of the most otherworldly looking stadiums is Houston's Astrodome, dubbed the eighth wonder of the world. Construction on the 74,000 seat stadium began in 1962. At a cost of $35 million, the Astrodome ushered in a new era of baseball parks. Its builders created an 18 story high dome ceiling that could house baseball, football, basketball, and countless other events. Like many of the newer stadiums, the Astrodome seemed to suffer from an identity crisis. The new breed of stadiums were built to save money, but they were not without their luxuries. 
the Astrodome introduced the very first Skybox. The exclusive Skyboxes, a place for relaxation and entertainment. Individually decorated suites with built-in closed circuit TV. This is really some kind of baseball. The success of the Astrodome Skybox created the desire for Skyboxes in most of the parks to follow. The Skyboxes represent the ultimate in creature comforts. They became a huge success, but not all innovations were so well received. When the old ballpark started to crumble, they were replaced with multi-purpose stadiums in which both baseball and football were played. Unfortunately for baseball, the spectator demands between the two sports were very different. Which is easy enough to visualize once you think about the playing fields of the two sports. Huge majority of the seats are nowhere near the infield and therefore it took away the intimacy of the game. Another complaint about the Astrodome involved the field itself. Its evolution was due to an unforeseen chain of events. Originally, the dome's translucent ceiling panels created so much glare that players were blinded when they looked up. To reduce the glare, a translucent acrylic coating was applied to the panels. The glare was reduced, but the lack of light killed the grass. The sod was removed and a plastic grass carpet was installed. The synthetic surface was dubbed AstroTurf and many players claimed it was like playing baseball on concrete. For purists, this mix of baseball and technology was near sacrilege, but there was no refuting that this was the wave of the future. The Astrodome featured the world's first exploding scoreboard. More than half an acre of computer sequence lights, 14,000 lights in all would raise the ballpark experience to a new level. It's a home run! late 1960s brought about cookie-cutter multi-purpose facilities with names like Riverfront Stadium, Three Rivers Stadium, and Veteran Stadium. They each seated 50,000 fans and had symmetrical playing surfaces covered with AstroTurf. The new stadiums also shared another unwanted trait. Instead of fans identifying a park with its individual owner, they now had to identify with a faceless bottom line oriented corporation. Well, one of the things about these concrete donuts, as I call them, w was the fact that they were no longer built by one person. It wasn't Scheib Park, Comiskey Park, Wrigley Field, Ebbets Field, Griffith Stadium. It was some absolutely atrocious, safe-as-hell corporate name, Riverfront Stadium. It sounds like a goddamn housing development. Three Rivers Stadium veteran stadium so they were compromises right from the get-go as widespread as the concrete donuts became they never would were, were never accepted by the fans at least the baseball fans and were always looked upon with derision I spent nine years living in Philadelphia uh, when I arrived in Philadelphia in the early 70s the skeleton of of Scheib Park was still there uh, obviously desolate and, and uh, ready to be torn down and the vet at that time was about three years old. I never had a problem watching a game in, in, at the vet because I really love baseball, so as long as I was watching the game, I didn't have a problem. The fans weren't the only ones unhappy with baseball's concrete donuts. Richie Hebner of the Pirates always said that, that there were some days he'd be out in the field and forget where he was because he'd look around the park and he wouldn't be able to tell uh, which stadium he was in. The casualties of these new modern multi-purpose facilities were the quaint old downtown historic ballparks. One by one, teams left parks from the golden era of ballpark construction, which were not only replaced, but demolished. Cincinnati's Crossley Field, built in 1912, was raised in 1970. 
Pittsburgh's Forbes Field, the second stadium built out of steel and concrete, was demolished in 1971. And Philadelphia's Scheib Park, the very first concrete and steel park, was demolished in 1976. The 1960s were the dark ages of ballpark construction. Our nation was tired of chaos, and the old ballparks were kind of chaotic. They, they had irregular fences. You never knew what to expect. They were funny bounces on the outfield walls. They were funny bounces on the grass. And the whole nation just decided that uniformity was beautiful, and you can understand by what was going on in our society. However, it was the dark ages of ballpark constructions because they were all the same. The building trend continued from 1962 to 1989 just one baseball-only stadium was built, Royal Stadium in Kansas City. But advancements in stadium technology were still being made. On June 5, 1989, the Toronto Sky Dome opened. Taking a page from the Astrodome, the new stadium sported a 282-foot-high dome ceiling with one improvement. It was convertible. Moving at 71 feet per minute, it takes 20 minutes for the three-piece, 11,000-ton structure to retract. As the two top pieces telescope backwards, the end of the dome rotates 180 degrees, blowing the lid off the 60,000-seat stadium. Though improvements like retractable roofs brought some light back to the game, the larger venue still lacked intimacy. A growing cry from fans would soon convince owners that a change was needed. Fans wanted something new. What they would get was a piece of history. The concrete donut stadiums had dominated baseball for nearly 30 years. Many complained that baseball had lost its sense of intimacy. In 1992, the Baltimore Orioles took a bold step forward with their creation of Camden Yards. It was pretty clear from the outset that uh, the Orioles and the Maryland Stadium Authority wanted to do something that would set a new standard. Joe Spear is the chief architect for the Kansas City-based HOK Sports Facilities Group, the leading sports architectural firm in America. HOK was brought in to not only design Camden Yards, but also advise on its location. Well, we actually looked, in, in terms of deciding the site uh, for Camden Yards in Baltimore, we looked at uh, a couple of dozen sites. Uh, the mayor, uh, at that point, did a very smart thing. He asked the public for input as to where the baseball park should be built. And I think we got about 27 or 28 different suggestions about where the park should be. And we thought, as did the Orioles and the Stadium Authority, that if the ballpark were downtown, people would make a day of it. Built in Baltimore's historic warehouse district, close to the Baltimore shoreline and parallel to the trolley car tracks used by fans at the turn of the century, Camden Yards is the crown jewel of baseball's attempt to create and build stadiums reminiscent of a bygone era. When you talk about the evolution of baseball parks, you start with your wooden facilities, and then you move ahead to your steel and concrete, such as Forbes Field, Ebbets Field, Fenway Park, so on. You then move towards the super stadium concepts, such as a Yankee Stadium or a Cleveland Municipal Stadium. As you move into the 1960s, you get into uh, the cookie cutter, multi-purpose uh, ballpark. Still lots of seats, uh, less obstructed views, uh, and obviously the ability to accommodate uh, more than one sport. And then finally, you get into uh, kind of the, the retro parks, the, the, the retro classic parks, such as Camden Yards. And that's really the the genius of Camden Yards. Uh, for once, uh, they didn't build uh, at, the, at the intersection of two interstates. It was built in the city. It was part of the city. The city was part of the ballpark. The ballpark was part of the city. No fewer than 10 major league parks, such as Cleveland's Jacobs Field and Denver's Coors Field, have followed Camden Yards' lead 
with great success. When Denver was awarded an expansion franchise, part of the selling point was the new stadium's location. Again, HOK wanted the park downtown and reflective of the community. Really, our challenge was to design a park that fit that community. It's, the site is adjacent to the lower downtown district, and we thought the real chance for doing something uh, incredibly meaningful for the city was really in what it, would, what it would do to the neighborhoods around the ballpark and what it would mean to the lower downtown area. So that really, I think, is the, the success story of Coors Field. Years of baseball experience have culminated in today's high-tech baseball park designs. Enron Field in Texas and Pacific Bell Park in San Francisco are baseball's newest breed of retro parks. The site that we're building on out here is about 12.8 acres, and to give you some measure of how small that is, the footprint, the physical footprint of Coors Field wouldn't fit on this site. So we told the Giants that the China Basin site would be worth that, that challenge and worth that effort because of the way it makes the Bay part of the game of baseball in San Francisco. Getting 40,000 people to the games on time was another concern for the Pac Bell designers. One of the great things about Pac Bell Park is it's going to have its own ferry dock, so you can actually ride the ferry to the ball game. Uh, and I, you know, I think that adds to the experience. I mean, people talk about, oh, I, I remember the Subway Series, or I remember riding the L and going to a Cubs game. And so, you know, not only does it help the practical, functional characteristics of getting people out to the park, but it adds a lot of richness and texture to their game day experience. Pac Bell Park being on the bay is, is going to be fantastic. It's going to be very special. In terms of our visualization process, we like to design projects that, that fit a community. In San Francisco, for us, that was all about San Francisco Bay. In Pacific Bell Stadium, the right field fence will be very short, and if somebody hits a homer clearing the fence, it may land on the bay, which will make it very interesting. Where else can you have home runs splashing on the ocean? Pacific Bell will set the pace probably for the next 10 to 20 years. 16 new multi-million dollar parks are on the drawing boards, and these new parks are finding their way back into the hearts of the cities. The goal for all modern baseball parks is to provide an intimate, baseball-only, fan-friendly setting reminiscent of baseball stadiums' glory years with all of today's amenities. We feel passionate about ballparks because ballparks are part of our culture. It used to be that there was real life and then there was sports. Uh, now it's a little bit of both. This is another sad thing about life and sports. But your Uncle Sid and your, your Aunt Thelma that you love and you, know, you see them two or three times a year, well, you see John Franco 80 times a year, or Bernie Williams, or Mark McGuire. You know more about them than you know about your family. In a sense, they are your family. So where they, quote, live, unquote, is the ballpark. From the sandlots of the 19th century to modern technological wonders, baseball parks are part of our heritage with each revered park that comes down, we lose a little innocence. But with each new park, we embrace the future. But no matter how the parks change, they will always be the homes to America's pastime. Like magic, the clout makes the clouds roll by. The Bambino is back. The season rushes on.